Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 27 of the 40K Badcast. My name is Dan Boyd, and I am joined, as always, by my own personal Jesus, Crabman McLobsterfest. How you doing, Crabman? As a New Englander, I'm offended by these seafood puns you're ravaging on my name. <laughs> Although I did find out the other day that I think oysters, northeastern oysters, are considered the best oysters in the world. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't know anything about that because I'm not from the Northeast. You're missing out on uh, 30 degrees and two feet of snow coming tonight. Uh, oh, am I? Would you say I'm missing out? Because I don't think I'm missing out on that. I guess it's a matter of perspective. My girlfriend, the teacher, would be happy, though, so she could miss school. But, you know, for me, it's just like, oh, shit, now I have to walk to work in the snow. Yeah, I work from home, so I don't even get that excuse. Anyway, we're a podcast about war for 40,000. We are the 40K <laughs> Badcast. We are bad at 40K, and so can you. Yes, we are terrible at 40K to the point where we do a podcast about it, which is a weird thing to do, come to think of it. Now we're 27 episodes in. It's kind of it's kind of weird. I mean, not knowing a damn thing about what's going on in the world hasn't stopped, I don't know, Infowars. Hot take, hot take, hot take. But <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Um, wow. All right. God. Well, let, before we get any more political, well, you'll we'll, we'll figure it out later. Kids. <laughs> you'll you'll find but, out a lot worse. <laughs> let's get into the aspects here, uh, where we talk about what's on our hobby radar. And uh, Campbell, I've been again pretty fucking prolific here, at least by my standards, with nice. with the sprint to complete things by Adepticon. Uh, in the last two weeks, I have finished five intercessors and a Primaris captain. All right, that's not too shabby. No, not for not not for me at least. Uh, I've posted pictures on my Twitter, and I, I know that you've liked them at least. I have. So if anybody wants to go see pictures of some beautiful bird boys, I say, hey, follow me on Twitter. But that's two things I finished. You might want to pick those models up with some falconer's gloves because they are sharp. Ooh, look at you, bud. Yeah, that's a multi-layer joke. Wow. Okay. Because birds. Because <laughs> birds, you know. <laughs> So this week, it's Hellblaster week for me, where mm. I've got to finish a squad of five Hellblasters by Friday, end of uh, end of day Friday, because I'm leaving for Austin, Texas on Saturday. Uh, by the way, kids, it's Tuesday, the 6th of March, when we're recording this, just so you know. And I've got all five Hellblasters done to the point of edge highlighting black. Nice. So Which I've is only got the clearly longest. the thing that takes the least amount of time when painting yeah. these models. Yeah, right. Only got the longest and most onerous thing to do left on those guys, and then they'll be done. Uh, and then after that, next week, when I get back from South by Southwest, is Repulsor Week, and I'll have about six days to do a Repulsor. Which, can he do it? We'll fucking see. I mean, that. so I'm not so worried about that, because it's really... Everything on it is either black or silver with a little bit of white and then some mm -hmm. decals on it. Yeah. Are you going to do any weathering on it? No, I don't. I, I do. You've seen my guys. They're clean. Well, I know. I My infantry are clean, too, but I always weather my vehicles a bit. And I found that as someone who gets rather tired of edge highlighting, you know, rivet number 355 in a Land Raider, that when you can just kind of fudge it and weather the bottom third to half of the vehicle, it makes that a lot easier. <laughs> I can imagine, but I've never done it before, so I, I think maybe I can go back and use some weathering powders or something later if I'm into it. But then again, it's also a repulsor, so it's not really dragging across the ground like a tank. I don't know. The point is, I'm not going to weather it right now. Okay, okay. Uh, so what are you working on? Whew, well, I finished those dumb Vespid models that I did not like working on. hey -oh. Um I found out later they're actually Juan Diaz sculpts, and he's really good, so I'm curious what uh, led him to slum it so hard in those boys. Um, painted up a squad of eight neophytes I talked about last time with a bunch of the different special weapon options just so I can customize my squads. I painted the one of the fourth edition chaplains with a skull helmet and the bolt pistol, but I g gave him a weapon conversion. However, he's kind of short. Like, he's a good head shorter than a regular space marine, and he's not that old a model. Really? Yeah, he's barely taller than the scouts I, I put him next to, and he's just, he's he's a little skelly man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I built 10 militia for Age of Sigmar, but I found a bunch of bits of hands holding tankards and hands holding bottles and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of rambling drunks with firearms and knives, which is pretty cool. Um, Very nice. I figure that regiment will be called the Altdorf Alehounds. Okay. Uh, 
Are you is then, Altdorf that your that you, that's your province? No, I'm Talapheim, but that's the only alliterative one I could think of. The um, Talapheim tankards. I was thinking the talent the Talapheim tappers was also a pretty good one, but I really like the term alehound. But you could yeah, model. They, I got. I got it. I got okay. It. Uh, by the way, all your problems are going to cease because I figured it out. You should model little joints hanging out of their mouths, and they can be the Talpheim tokers. <laughs> oh, the uh... oh man, my Mid Atlantic accent showed a little bit <laughs> with tokers. the words tokers. <laughs> and the Talpheim tokers. Oh God, I'm and sorry. They, they have preferred enemy against the Beastmen Blazers. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> There is a regiment numbered 420 men, and wherever one falls, <laughs> one more will take his place. Oh, God. Yeah. So, anyway, I did I did give them a monkey, though, uh, and he's holding a little keg with a tap I uh, oh, converted nice. onto the front of it. Nice. Uh, I built an Empire steam tank, and I've started working on a bunch of movement trays because I've played a few games of this army, and when that, like, 1,500 points, you've got, I don't know, 150 models on the table. Movement trays are really nice. Isn't yeah. that isn't that fun? You yeah. <laughs> the game went away from movement trays because they were, you know, focusing on heroes and smaller size units and more elite things. And then now we look at you and your fucking fuckboyness over here. The Empire has back. none of those things. It has absolutely none of those things. Good but, for you, bud. But yeah, so keeping that's it, all keeping been, it old school. Well, the entire army's even still on square bases. Like they're I, I keep it very old school. Very nice. But, yeah, that's all the stuff I've been working on. I've just kind of been a bit of trying to build boxes that I have on my shelves because I'm moving soon, and every box I build that I can put in foam is one less box I need to pack elsewhere. So there's kind of a uh, there's kind of a logic to it. You move a lot. Yeah, but this will be the last time I move for the foreseeable future because I'm buying a house with my lady friend. So well, good for you. Let's move on to a new segment of the Auspects that I call the Video Games segment of the Auspects. A very creative name. So you mentioned you wanted to talk about video games, but I'm going to preempt you here and talk about video games for a moment. And I've been playing way too much Total War Warhammer. Ugh, the game's so good. I have been playing, honestly, a problematic amount of Total War Warhammer. <laughs> and I love that game. It's fantastic. Uh, it's not easy. It's pretty difficult. No. And the battles are... Probably my least favorite part of it. I just like going really? from province to province and creating my economy. Who who are you playing as in the most diplomatic take on conquering the old world I've ever heard of? Orcs. <laughs> <laughs> Wait again to the spirit of things, Dan. Grimgore, man. He's the best. Yeah, he is. That, But he's not like an economist. Well, maybe not your Grimgore. My Grimgore is a real smart guy. You don't get a name like Ironhide by being a smart guy who think who talks with his brain. Maybe maybe he's Ironhide because he just, you know, doesn't let it phase him. He's like mm. he he like takes a step back. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to let that bother me. Gore is the second half of his first name. It's that's just a name. That's a nonsense word. And you know it. It's like, what's your name? I, oh, I'm Handshake McDeals and Mergers. <laughs> Like, yeah, that's the name of a guy who wants to take over the world through economy and peace. But no, this guy, his name's Grimgore Ironhide. That's not a friendly man's name. Listen, I got an idea. I'll yeah. play video games the way I want to play them, and okay. you can shut the fuck up. Okay, well, Warhammer Total War is why I have an Empire army, and I remember all the unit names because every unit in the Empire, at least, says their name like a Pokemon when you click on them. <laughs> So, Carl <laughs> Franz! I'm like, oh, okay, cool. All right, Carl Franz. The orcs what do. do you have to, what do you orcs have to do. say? So they're like, Biggins! Or if they're on board, Boar Boy Biggins! <laughs> like, all right, cool. Oh, bulbous Boar Boy Biggins bounding across the <laughs> <Boar> barricades. <laughs> Peppus. God. <laughs> <laughs> And Carl Franz even even evolves into Carl Franz on a bigger animal. He is a Pokemon. <laughs> Yo, you know what's the tightest though is when you've got like a character with a bunch of points in assassination, and you yeah. just like run around the map, and you're like, "Oh, look, there's Carl Franz! Boom! Stabbed him in the back. Constantly. He's yeah, dead I, for five I, turns." 
My favorite time I played was, uh, how far have you gotten? Have you gotten to, like, Archaeon invading and all the chaos stuff yet? Yeah, but the good thing about orcs is orcs are way down south. So yeah. there's, like, a whole bunch of stuff between you and Archaeon. Okay. So I, he invaded, and I was just like, huh. So Kislev is going to get their ass kicked. But me, <laughs> I don't give a fuck. My favorite was when I played, and the ca- chaos invasion comes down i fight him off in some places and everyone bands together and they fight them off and i'm stuck fighting sigvald magnificent's army and i'm like shit i see him coming down but he just moved out off of another battle that i guess he lost and the battle was my full stack of crossbows handguns cannons and so on versus just sigvald the magnificent oh wow (laughs) his entire army was dead and he had no health so i start the game and you know in monty python the holy grail that one shot where he's just running at the castle and he keeps cutting back and forth that was sigvald coming at my army (laughs) and then he got fucking perforated from 500 yards oh poor sigvald there's a magnificent end to a magnificent man he's a magnificent target Okay, you wanted to talk about Dawn of War 3, I think. Yeah, I did. So the developers recently came out that no more work will go into the game. Like, no more DLC, no more patches. At least as far as I could tell, no more patches. They are done working on the game. And a lot of people are kind of pissed about that. But they're the same people who are like, this is the worst game ever. I don't want to play it. Because if you like the game, if you if you play the game and you like it, you know, you're you're like, all right, cool. And, you know, the developer isn't supporting it. Well, you've got a game you like, and you can play that for the foreseeable future until its community is completely dead. But there's all these people who hated the game who I guess just really wanted it to be a different game altogether. And I guess they don't understand that no amount of work will turn one game into a completely different game. Well, I, I mean, there's like Kickstarters and shit, like well after the fact that you can do that. I mean, it's- for what what games have gotten re kickstarted? Pillars of Eternity was oh, th- like right. the spiritual successor to Baldur's Gate that was a Kickstarter, a huge success too. Uh, okay, I, okay, that's that's a slightly different thing because that's like a whole different game. They they wanted Dawn of War three to get patched until it was Dawn of War one again, which isn't possible. That's like man, I really wish Tetris was more Call of Duty. I really do. Well, why don't they just go play Dawn of War one? That's the thing I've been saying for about probably since Dawn of War 2 came out to people who are upset about the new games. They just want the same game over again. Well, let me let me just take the position of Grimgor Ironhide here and just tell you to let it bounce right off your Ironhide. And ooh, it's OK ooh. if people want to have bad opinions and get mad about stuff, they're going to do it regardless of what you say or what anybody else says. They're just going to be like, you know what? I haven't shouted at the moon lately, so I'm going to go do it right now. <laughs> Fuck you, moon. I will say, I, I, I'm i not the game's biggest fan. I'm really not. Like My big old review I posted of it long ago is ambivalent at best, and I will say it has killed my interest in Blood Ravens. So I'm, I've been thinking about what to do with my Primaris Marines since then. Make so them I'm, Black Templars. I'm thinking they're going to go Black Templars. Do it, but, man. Yeah. So I've Unless you got, get tired of painting black. I clearly haven't gotten bored of it yet. <laughs> I've painted 4,000 points of Black Templars in the past year and change, so I'm clearly not done yet. Not done yet. So I've been, uh, as I've been painting, I was listening to an audiobook, Campbell. Ooh, which one? The Talon of Horus by Aaron oh. Dembski Bowden. That book rules. It's good. So I, I, I don't really have too much to say here, except I'm really fucking enjoying it. It's a great book. No, I, uh, my friend Nick just texted me the other day. He's listening to that and Black Legion right now, and he's having the hardest time not, you know, buying a shitload of Chaos Space Marines. I think the only thing holding him back is probably the fact that their models were kind of shitty. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that because Chaos sucks and always will suck, and they're a bunch of loser fuckboys. But I do like the characters, and it is a lot of fun to listen to. No, ADB writes real good bad guys. I haven't read Black Legion yet, but I should be picking up my friend's copy uh, in about a week. So something else important happened last week. Yeah. The registration for Nova Open opened up. That it did. And I don't know about you, if you've been checking, but like nothing like narrative wise for the 40K narrative is open anymore. It's all it's all uh, sold out. We've been spreading the word for over a year about that. So this would usually be the time when we go on and say, hey, guys, if you're interested in having a good week in a 40K with some cool dudes, 
come join the 40K narrative and play that. And right now, there might be a couple of spots open in for, you know, individual games here and there for the narrative. But for the whole thing, for the Warlords, for the whole, like, experience, I think it's all full up. Well, if you're listening to this show on March 1st, five days before we recorded this, <laughs> get online by 8 p.m. Eastern and show up to the Nova Open website to watch the site get basically DTOS. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm very, very excited about it, man. I think oh, man. Uh, last year was a was a trip. It was a great time. And it still is the best experience you can have, I think, with 40K. It's my favorite week in gaming. And yeah, no, since th- since like I'm always like, oh, cool, it's coming up. I'm looking forward to it. And then once once I have financial stake in it, I'm like, yeah, I'm fucking ready. Like if Nova was tomorrow, <laughs> I'd be happy to go. Yeah, I don't, I don't definitely wouldn't have 2,500 points of Primaris Raven Guard put together. But, you know, fuck it. I fudge the numbers with a Bane Blade. <laughs> So uh, a couple of new things, new stuff came out. Yeah. And one of them stuff too. I'm very excited about. And one Mm. of them I don't give a shit about at all. So let's start with the one I'm super excited about. And it's Forge Bane, Mm. which is a starter set. I guess it's a starter set. It's sort of like the Death Mask set from last edition with the Death Watch and the Eldar. And that's like not a starter set. It's more to get it's more like to start collecting boxes mashed together. Right, so it's uh, uh, Necrons and Adeptus Mechanicus, and it has three brand new models in it. The Knight Armager, which is like a mini knight, mm-hmm. and the new Necron, or I guess not the new, the only Necron Cryptek. <laughs> it, can be, it can be new and only. It can, it's like how Gaunt was his dad's first and only. Uh, there you go. So these models, man, the Cryptek, I don't really care about too much because I'm not a Necron guy. Uh, I know that the four Necron players that still exist are probably very, very <laughs> excited about this this new model. Um, but the Knight Armagers, you know, we saw a very brief uh, pictures and intro f- of them from LVO. But now we get some more uh, larger, more close up pictures. And these things, I think, look cool as hell. They're just scaled down knights. Yeah, they even have some, some of the armor plates are still about the same size, like namely the groin plate pretty much. And that gives it a sense of scale that you can even tell from the pictures. But the it looks like it's remind the me of the, armature. of the Sidonian Dragoons also. Mm. So yeah. they, look, they look a little more speedy. Yeah, which hopefully they are. I really do. <laughs> There's a whole family of knights now. You know, you, so you can have the two armagers and a knight and just have it be the don't talk to me or my sons ever again list. <laughs> That's your super heavy detachment right there. <laughs> But they're really cute. I like them. I'm curious to see more of the options and more potential paint schemes for them, because the only thing we've seen is them in that ad mech scheme, which is cool, but I like going for the more knightly heraldry, that sort of shit when it comes to knights. Right. But the models are cool, and if you like Necrons or ad mech, well, if you want anything but Armager Warglaives, there's going to be a fuckload of money bay real soon for real cheap. Exactly, yeah. So... The deal in this box is apparently, I'm, I'm not sure on the pricing yet, but apparently it's pretty darn good for what you get uh, and what you pay. Uh, you get a, For the ad mech, you get a Tech Priest Dominus, two Knight Armagers, and one squad of either Rangers or Vanguard, Skatari Rangers or Skatari uh, Vanguard. And then for the Krons, you get a Crypt Tech, five Immortals, five Lich Guard, and three Wraiths. That's a good start for either armor. That's a really good, really good point, man. eBay is going to be full of super cheap Admech and Krons coming up soon because people are going to buy this box either just for the Armagers, and I imagine mm-hmm. a lot of people will probably do that, uh, or just for the Cryptek. From what I hear, it's going to be a pretty big discount. So if it is that big, like if it is a big enough discount where it's only like twenty bucks more in the Armagers, like that's worth buying just so you can sell off the stuff and make some money back. But it looks great. I'm 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 not going to start an Admech army or anything like that, but I'll grab some armagers when I can find them. I mean, I would consider grabbing the a couple of armagers just to fill out a super heavy detachment. Yeah, you know, it might be also it might be a fun intro into painting a knight or what painting a knight would be like. Oh yeah, painting a knight's fast. Well, it's it's for you. no no, it's fast. You just leave the skeleton. Uh, you leave the armor plates off. The skeleton you can just prime black. Dry brush metal, you know, do a few coats of that, washes and all that stuff. That part's easy. And the plates, if you can just hit them with a colored spray, you're halfway done. Um, my 
my only regret is that my night is fucking yellow. And <laughs> ugh. yellow like is I, not the easiest color to paint. No, nah, I almost threw that thing in the garbage like three times. And Dylan was like, dude, just stick it out. Stick it out. It'll look good. It'll look good. And eventually it did. It was just a really rough few weeks of doing big, long coats of smooth yellow over big, smooth surfaces. It's just learn from my mistakes. Don't do a yellow night. So in other 40K news, they are previewing on Games Workshop Community Codex Tau. And I have one thing to say about that. And it's who cares? Not me. Chirp. Chirp. Yeah, nah, it's, yeah, it's fine. Cool. I look forward to my army getting boned by Tau even harder. Great. It's going to be great at Nova cool. when I see a bunch of fucking riptides across the table. And I'm just like, cool. Cool. Trip tides are back. Glad uh, to see these guys are around. <laughs> yeah, great. Cool. Whatever. Cool. Yeah. We've already talked too long about Tau by <laughs> pausing awkwardly too long about Tau. <laughs> All right. So anything else in the aspects you want to touch? There's a bunch of Age of Sigmar stuff came out. The Daughters of Cain stuff are all out and those models are gorgeous love the snake ladies great models uh they also came out with the blasted hollow heart which is the age of sigma version of the moon base crisis set so it's got the weird cardboard tile table and uh these azurite ruins which the ruins are cool i might pick those up because those seem like they'd be usable for both age of sigma and 40k yeah, you kinda... slap those on a piece of mdf put some fucking yeah. gravel on it and dry brush it and you're good to go yep they're kind of generic but they, they look cool and also, uh, Gene Steeler cults are in the Necromunda White Dwarf. That wow. they are. Not the Necromunda White Dwarf, but you know what I meant. <laughs> I'm here. I'm awake. But I yeah. didn't. I didn't really get a chance to look at them, look at the White Dwarf too much yet. I haven't even gotten it yet. I just know they're coming. the The rules have been leaked or posted or whatever out there. I know Peter's excited to get to using them on his guys, but they I'm might sure. need to be FAQ'd from what I gather. So yeah, probably. Uh, speaking of Peter. He invited, uh, I think, both of us to what he's calling the Necro Slam Spa Weekend in May. Plus, I, I would love it if he only invited you and this is the first I was hearing about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was tremendously douchey. Uh, <laughs> that would be fucking great. But no, if I figure if, if, if he's inviting anybody first, it's you. And then then I would be the one. You'd be like, hey, you hear about this? And I'd be like, No. <laughs> Sadness. Uh, but no, I'm gonna, I go to, I'm gonna go, go to the No Dan's Allowed party. I'm gonna go up to uh, New Jersey, Wanakew, New Jersey, and I'm gonna play some Necro with my buds, and I'm pretty excited about that. I'm hoping I can go. It's it's coming at a time like right on the cusp of when we're gonna be moving, so I might not be available. I I'll figure it out. If I can go, I'm stoked to go. I really want to. But yeah, it'll we'll be, figure it out. It's gonna be a rad time. So speaking of rad times, mm-hmm. Adepticon my friend, is about two weeks away. By the time that this drops, is. which I'm hopefully going to be able to get it out on the 7th of March here. Uh, Ambitious. But, yeah, right? Tomorrow. Uh, hopefully, that well, that will be exactly two weeks from when I'm leaving for Adepticon. So, I'm getting pretty pumped, dude. Eight. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry if this is like the let's rub it in Campbell's face segment no. of the show. I know you're not going to be able to make it due to your various and sundry medical issues, but... Yep. It's going to be great. So I would just want to run down what I'm going to be at. So if any listeners want at the uh, con want to come up and say hi, they'll know where to find me. So Wednesday, we're doing the GW preview seminar and uh, trying not to party too hard because a lot of people partied way too hard on Wednesday night at Nova last year. And at Epticon too. Yeah, but I'm going to try to take it easy on Wednesday. Thursday, though, is the Gentleman's 40K tournament. And it's a 100 power level tournament. That uh, I need to. This this is where the repulsor comes in. The repulsor makes it into the gentleman's turn, but not the friendly. So hopefully I'll have that done for it. If not, I'll probably just sub it for a bunch of land speeders. Or is the friendly or smaller or what? The friendly is on Friday and it's fifteen hundred points. Okay, so, it so it's is smaller. It's smaller in quotes. But I'll be bringing my uh, Primaris Raven Guard Battalion and Vanguard mm-hmm. detachments. Uh, to to the fr- uh, the I'm sorry the gentleman's tournament and uh, just the battalion for the friendly because they got a bunch of limits on you can only bring one detachment to the okay. uh, to the friendly so I threw everything in the battalion and then Saturday and Sunday I'm gonna play a bunch of Blood Bowl which uh, I I looked into it and I'm not super thrilled about the format because what it's is it? it's uh, like you pick a bunch of skills beforehand and your guys don't level up through the tournament which is the mm-hmm. most fun part about Blood Bowl but yeah. You know, whatever. I'll I mean, still, I, I'm sure I'll have fun. 
I get for a tournament that's a little less bookkeeping and everyone's on a more even ground that way and no one can just kind of fudge the numbers or whatever and buff up some skills or whatever. Yeah. I guess for the sake of fairness, it might make things easier. Yeah. Between it does. people who it don't does really actually. know each other that well. Uh, and Thursday, of course, I will be buying all of the Forge World crap that I want to buy <laughs> uh, before it gets sold out. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on any new Blood Bowl stuff, which I haven't heard anything uh, uh, for that yet as far as like uh, special characters or star players go. And then the Necromunda hired guns and special characters will probably end up picking those up. I will not be buying the Astraeus at... Not yet. At uh, Schaumburg. Because I don't want to try to have to bring it home. <laughs> you don't want to bring back like a 25-pound resin albatross? No, I do not. I've seen a couple of pictures of people that have completed that thing recently, and it looks pretty fucking boss. No, that thing looks great. I really, I don't think I'm going to get one, but I love the look of it. It's right. the kind of thing where I still don't know where in my house I'd put it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. It's pretty fucking huge. So if you see me at Adepticon on Thursday and Friday, I'll probably be wearing the sweet bad cast bad shirt, which everybody should have by now. <laughs> <laughs> if you did what we said and went out and bought one a surprising number I, i've gotten a lot of them actually well and for like a very brief amount of time i was like whoa somebody just bought two shirts and then you're like hey campbell guess what i just bought two shirts i'm like I, oh cool dan is now the person with the single largest collection of <laughs> bad cast merchandise <laughs> in the entire planet i did buy two bad cast shirts and i've already worn them they're very comfortable cool well so i want to tell a thing about that so I was going for a run the other day and I was wearing this kind of rough cotton shirt and about 20 minutes in, I just felt this awful chafing on my nipples oh, and man. for the next like day or two, they were just sore. Oh. And the next time I went out, I had to Vaseline them up before I went for a run <laughs> just so I could get that glide action on. But you know what won't chafe and won't require you to Vaseline up your nipples? The bad cast bad shirt. There you have it, folks. That's a testimonial. Right there for you. But they come in a bunch of cuts, colors, and sizes. Shop.spreadshirt.com slash camtoons. We'll plug them again up to the end of the show. But let's move on. Let's let's move on to what we're calling Outlanders. The discussion about the supplement book for Necromunda. Or I have a subtitle here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Why It's Dangerous to Ask a Bunch of White Guys from Britain to Write Class War Fiction. See, my subtitle for it was going to be how not woke Games Workshop was in 1995. <laughs> so Outlanders is a very beloved supplement of mine as the original run of Necromunda is what got me into the hobby. And I have read, I have my, right in front of me, I have my old copy of the Necromunda rulebook and Outlanders in one hardback with the Hazard Stripe book, if you remember mm -hmm. that one. Uh, I've got it open to Outlanders right now, and I love this book. It has so much good campaign stuff. It's got so much great art, so much great uh, stories and flavor text and everything. I think as far as anything that's been pr produced by Games Workshop since, this thing outshines all of them. Everything. That's, whew. As far as, like, hardy. it's got that's all the price. rules. It's got all the campaign rules. It's got mm -hmm. uh, tons of art and flavor and everything in it. I, I think it's fantastic. I, I love it. I, I love this book, and my copy is literally falling apart because I've looked at it uh, and read through it so many times. So I'd say it's old enough to drink. Yeah. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about what Outlanders is. It's a supplement to Necrom uh, Necromunda. Um, came with terrain counters and a bunch of other crap, uh, mm -hmm. but it had tons of new equipment, new campaign rules, new missions. Uh, and it had two tables that were super fun to use in your campaigns. The campaign events table, which sort of randomized stuff and made it made it very interesting. And the treacherous conditions table, Campbell. Do you ever use this in any games in Necromunda? No, I never had the good fortune to. I only played the uh, the Yacromunda sort of permutation of Necromunda. It was more or less community made. So it had some of that stuff integrated into it, but we didn't usually play with the more advanced stuff. Well, the... Treacherous Conditions is, you remember the, the whole D66 thing? Oh, yeah. Well, the Treacherous Conditions is a ton of fun. The first Necromunda game I ever played, we rolled up on the Treacherous Conditions, and what did I roll? A 66 right off the Ooh. bat. So it was a Hive Quake, which is basically you roll dice uh, and uh, uh, for every player and or every character in your gang, and you roll a one, and they're out for the game. 
Whoa. which was which could be a, an extremely bad problem as the underhive quakes and shakes and rocks fall from the ceiling and all that stuff. Oh, but there's cool. a, there's a ton of fun things that can happen. My favorite one is the uh, you roll a sixteen, so a one in the six uh, mm-hmm. is the pit of despair. <laughs> and let me read this real quick. Sounds the, lovely. The entire level of the tabletop is covered with a seemingly bottomless layer of sludge. The whole game must be fought on the higher levels, though any models that fall from gantries and walkers on the tabletop will not suffer any damage as their falls cushioned by the sludge. Unfortunately, <laughs> the model must also roll equal to or under their strength on a d6 at the start of each of their turns. If they succeed, they can move two inches per turn to the nearest gantry and climb out. If they fail, the model is automatically swallowed and suffocates in the thick sludge. Any equipment or weapons carried by the models drowned in the slime is lost. That's a big deal. Like, it's great that the floor is lava has actual rules. <laughs> That's yeah. a big deal. That's cool. So what this did, this supplement did, is it added a ton of flavor and, you know, random events and RNG shit to your Necromunda campaign, which was always my favorite part of the campaign. But it also introduced things like multiplayer missions. There was a great mission uh, called King of the Spire, which you ha- you got to pick up to three gang, I think three gangers from your, uh, from your team uh, or your gang or whatever, and you were in like an arena combat thing where there was like a big button at the top of the highest thing, and the whole idea was whatever gang gets a ganger up to that button hits it wins and the prizes were like crazy they were really good but there are things like you know the the game master or whatever the guy running the campaign would be would be there and like put like spiders or rats or millisaurs or you know whatever the hell else uh into the arena to cause problems for the gangers themselves which was a ton of fun but that was a great way to get a multiplayer because you could play with like four different gangs at that point Everybody's yeah. getting it going after one another. It was really fun. So this sort of stuff is touched on with the gang war books they've been coming out with. But instead of dumping it all at once, like with the Outlanders book, because that was really the only expansion to Necromunda outside of the, you know, the briefly lived like side catalog games and stuff like yeah. that. Um, instead of having this big book, we have the Gang War 1, Gang War 2, invariably Gang War 3 is coming out eventually. You know, they're doing it that way instead, right. which, which is which is fine. But it's fine. The books I've noticed they lack the production value of they do they've got some cool uh, art in them but not as none of the big like full page mark gibbons spreads and stuff like that none of the crazy wayne england style arrays of things going on it's a lot of of the the side character drawings which are really cool and they give it some flavor but it just doesn't have the same level of production as the original in a lot of ways oh and i forgot to mention they also had a huge uh, bestiary for rules of like mutants and creatures and stuff and also aliens like orcs or eldar or chaos space marines or whatever else Jeez. that could for whatever reason be on necromunda but i think it was just an effort to be like hey you probably have a collection of other stuff so if you do here's some rules that you can use it in necromunda games if you want to and then at the back of the book there's a whole section on campaign tips written by andy chambers himself which oh, was dope. really, uh, really cool to read. Uh, so let's uh, let's get into uh, let's get into what's in here a little bit. And um, I broke it up into sections here, uh, Campbell, where we're going to talk about uh, outlaw gangs, hired guns, special characters, and then the outlanders themselves. How does that okay. sound? Okay, I did a ton of homework on the outlanders themselves. And that's great. it. <laughs> great. Well, we'll 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 get there. Uh, so one of the first uh, things you can do with this book is add outlaws to your campaign and outlaws are regular gangs that have grown afoul of the law the guilders in necromunda and they've been basically kicked out of polite society in in quotes that is polite society uh and they can generate missions from the outlaw scenario table which are usually a lot more lucrative for the outlaws than they are for the defenders in those missions but they will piss off the guilders even more and what this means is that each gang has a bounty based on their gang rating if they're outlaws. And they can, if they can get enough money to pay off their bounty, they're welcome back into, again, in quotes, polite society. But if, uh, or they can just not care and continue being outlaws. Now, it makes it a little harder because outlaws can't have as much terrain or uh, not terrain, but what do you call it? Territories. Territories, thank you, uh, as regular gangs do. But they and they can't trade at the regular trading post. They have to go to the outlaw trading post, which is 
It's not worse because there's a bunch of stuff that you can't get at the regular trading post on the outlaw mm-hmm. trading post, but it's not better. So okay. being an outlaw makes it a little harder uh, for for your gang if you do it. But you can always voluntarily outlaw your gang, too, and be like, yeah, fuck it, fuck the police, <laughs> and go for it, too, which is always fun. Uh, they have a whole new section of hired guns. They introduced pit slaves, and pit slaves I thought were really, really cool. They were these big, buff, almost Goliath-looking dudes with, like, a shitty pistol in one hand and then a bunch of options for awesome close combat weapons in the other hands, like giant pruning shears or buzz saws or rock drills or huge fists or hammers. These replace their hands, too, or replace their arms, right? Yeah, yeah. And so these these characters, these pit slaves, were pit fighters that had escaped or bought their own freedom or whatever and were making their way through the underhive the only way they know how by hiring themselves out to murder people for money. Uh, <laughs> pit slaves were, I think, a very flavorful part of the game where if they're in your gang, the guilders would get pissed at you because they're basically escaped slaves that are working for you. And they'd be like, whoa, wait a second. That's that's problematic. And you're like, yeah, whatever. Uh, you could also hire weirds, which were psychers, low-level yeah. shitty psychers. Uh, you could get their four types, telepaths, telekinetics, pyromaniacs, and beast masters. And all of that is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I remember my uh, brother always used to use Beastmasters in games with his scavies. And we'll get to scavies in a minute, but it made for he always had a fuck ton of models on his <laughs> on his side. Uh, and I rarely, rarely ever did. But uh, I liked using weirds, too. I thought they were a very flavorful and fun thing. And, of course, pit slaves and weirds can be used by any gang. Like, if you're using the Outlander's, like, supplement, if you have them, mm-hmm. you can hire them and, and stuff. But using them in a game can bring consequences because the guilders could see you and say, wait a second, you're using these illegal dudes. And that's represented on a table. At the end of every game, you roll, and, like, there's pluses and minuses you can add to it. But if it's, I think it was a, like, four or lower, you're outlawed. or And, and then, a, like, Whoa. a ten or higher, you're basically promoted, you're deputized. And you huh. get, like, extra credits for uh, every game you play because you're acting on behalf of the guilders. But there are going to be severe penalties if you fuck up after that. So it's pretty uh, pretty granular and interesting process there. Um, and then there, before we get to Outlanders, there's one more section uh, about special characters. And these guys actually kind of get in with the Outlanders. So I'm just going to talk about uh, two right now. And then we'll bring the rest in during when we talk about the actual Outlanders themselves. Okay. Uh, one of them is Mad Donna Yulanti. Yeah. One of the most iconic models from Necromunda. That lady with the big hair, the plasma pistol, and the chainsword. And she was a very powerful fighter in Necromunda. Uh, cost a lot of money to hire, but she'd pretty much fuck anybody up. And she has a great story, too. The little the little blurb they, they talk about uh, before... Uh, her stats in the book, mm-hmm. uh, where they talk about she was a uphive, like nobleman's daughter, but uh, she didn't like her life or whatever. She wasn't cool with it. Uh, and they talk about, okay, so whatever it was, her character defects only became apparent when she first met her husband-to-be, Count Co. Iron, over a dinner of exotic off-world foods, crystal goblets, and gold-spun plates. They got as far as the fourth course, all right, before uh, Dion, which is her real name, uh, tenderly reached across and gouged the Count's eye out with a silver <laughs> fish fork. Wow. Pretty gnarly. She's got a rule, though, that is going to foreshadow a little bit, I think, what uh, we're talking about when we say that the 1995 Games Workshop crew wasn't exactly the wokest group of dudes. Uh, She's got a rule called Psycho Bitch, which I remember my mom saw it and got mad at me. (laughs) That's not quite play like you've got a pair, but it's on that level. Yeah, it's uh, it's a little bad. And so uh, the other uh, uh, special character I want to talk about is Bull Gorg who is a, the pit slave special character. Now, this guy was basically like the pit slave king who led a revolution and you know freed a bunch of his comrades. He's like a successful Angron. Yeah. <laughs> a successful fat Angron. Successful fat Angron with two turbo chainswords for arms. So uh, he's the only one of the characters who didn't get a model? No, he did uh, not. 
But uh, Dil- Dylan, because of course he does, has a uh, custom sculpted one that he commissioned from one of the guys in the Old Hammer group on Facebook. Oh wow, it is dope. I'll get I'll I'll uh, have him send me a picture. I'll just, we can post in the show notes later. It's like it looks just like the illustration. Well, he was a complete beast on the table, also like a, a close combat murder machine. If you could get him to fight for your dudes. Uh, but let's move on, Campbell, uh, to the Outlanders themselves. There are four new gangs you can play as in uh, Necromunda campaigns here, and they are all, I would say, from somewhat to extremely problematic <laughs> in in what they portray. And I kind of I kind of set them up as uh, uh, in in this discussion for the least problematic to the most problematic. Uh, okay, and so we'll 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 go through like that. So we're going to start with scavies, and scavies are what can only be described as the dirty, filthy pores <laughs> of Necromunda. This is if you start buying like resin models from Russia on eBay, this is how that starts. <laughs> like because well, the, the resin mutates you. The resin mutates you. You're buying that way because you're. A Filthy poor, but <laughs> oh god! So these are the guys who live in the sumps, which is the like you know how Necromunda. There's like the hive, then there's the underhive. This is like the under underhive. This is the grundle of the hive. <laughs> this is the sewer. This is this disgusting waste pit of every kind of filth and waste you can imagine, and that's where these guys live. Yeah, they are m- mutants. They are sickly, disgusting, homeless person looking uh, models uh, who. Uh, when they run out of money, they eat each other. There's a rule yeah. called cannibals where if they if they run out of uh, upkeep money, you just remove a ganger from your squad <laughs> and that one is eaten. Yeah, cannibalism is not unheard of uh, because, well, they're also they're scavies, which comes from scavenger, obviously. So the only way they get supplies is by scavenging them. They don't get to get paid by the guild houses and stuff like that. They are outside the reach of imperial law, outside the reach of imperial government. And just at the very bottom of the pile. So these guys are outlanders, which which means in game turn is game terms, I should say, is when they don't they don't they're not like outlaws that can buy off their outlaw status and come back to polite society. These guys are out of it for good because they're mutants or they're ugly or gross or poor or whatever else. But they're 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 basically because of where they come from. The guilders are like, nope, you can't be a part of our society, and we're going to kill you on sight. Uh, so their weapons are terrible. Mm. Normally you uh, only roll ammo rolls on a six in the game. Jeez. But uh, scavies roll them on ones and sixes. So Ooh. a third of every time they fire, they're going to run out of ammo. And their their weapons are all terrible, too. They're mm-hmm. low quality. They're just bad. Uh, however, scavenged garbage. Yeah. Right. They make it up for it in numbers and they're heavies. Their heavies are called scalies, who are so these, these like, are, big lizard men right. looking motherfuckers with yeah. giant spear guns and shit. They're not the kind of scalies with fur affinity accounts. Uh, they're just <laughs> these big killer croc looking guys who are mutated to have scales and they grow absolutely enormous. The models for them are comical on the 25 millimeter bases that came on at the time yeah. because yeah. they are like the size of ogres. Oh, uh, speaking of bases, real quick, Cam, I want you to guess what the heavy metal team, what color they painted the Necromunda characters' bases in this book. Goblin green? <laughs> exactly. Oh. <laughs> All right, real talk, I have a uh, still new in box, 1990s Goliath box set, oh, and shit. the box is all caution striped. Yeah. And I've got all of them. I've even got the guy with the chainsaw hat. Nice. And I think I'm going to do them in the uh, Goblin green base. Oh, yes. If I can get them ready for uh, the... The spa slam weekend. I'll Necro, see if I can do that. I don't Necro know if I'll be able to spa weekend. Anyways, but. so uh, scaly scalies are giant. Yeah. Rad. Their their stats are amazing. They were all in. They're great in combat. They there's one comes with a, the only model that really existed for scalies was one. He had a fucking spear gun and mm. it was tight because he could shoot through other gangers. It would hit one, kill that guy, go through him, and then hit the guys behind him. The modern Orlock harpoon gun does the same thing. Oh, does it really? Even in the new Necro, yeah. Fucking radical. But what else do uh, Scavies have with them? So they make up for their bad uh, their bad everything. guns, no armor, bad everything, basically, with mutants. So there's a bunch of mutations Scaly Gangers can take. And they can just pay for them. Uh, things like eye stalks, so they can uh, <laughs> they can squeeze behind cover better. Uh, the claws to get 
better strength in combat, spikes, extra arms, wings, tentacles, two heads, all sorts of fun stuff to give them a little bit of an edge. And most the mutations you really uh, modify their stats somewhat, modify the mm-hmm. actual model stats. But what my brother always used to do with his cavies was buy a fuck ton of plague zombies for every game. Yeah, so plague zombies, like it's unclear how these are related to say Typhus's plague zombies in the fluff, but it's assumedly that even down in the under 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 Grundle Hive, uh, the touch of chaos is still there. The Grundle Hive. But the Grundle Hive. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Grundle Hive. We've got disease and zombies. I don't know. C minus. So um, plague zombies. Yeah. Ten credits for D six. Plague zombies. <laughs> so you know and what ten Sam, credits is chump change. You know what Sam would do? What he'd he'd spend like in his gang creation, he'd spend like a hundred credits on fucking plague yeah. zombies, and then he, yeah. he'd be like, "Oh, I've got ten d six zombies," <laughs> and, uh, and he'd always borrow my uh, like uh, Warhammer Fantasy zombies for him, and he'd be like, "Oh, mm. I need." I need 35. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. And then then that's how you win games of Necromundo, by the way, in 1997. Have fun with your quote unquote skirmish game. Yeah, 35 fucking zombies. And if, of course, Necromunda, you had to shoot at the closest thing. <laughs> Yep. So he's just like, here's these giant ranks. Now, in later versions of the game, I think they put limits on how many uh, like plague zombie uh, hordes or plague zombie clutches you could get. But mm-hmm. it, it's they're extremely powerful in the fact, they, they, and they suck. Their their uh, their stats are terrible. They don't, they can't run. They move slow. They're they're just bad. Uh, but you can just get a, a shit ton of them, mm-hmm. which is no good. Now the gang itself focused on stealth and ferocity, two kind of opposite, <laughs> yeah, uh, skill sets. Because like the stealth stealth. Uh, Stuff was like uh, harder to hit. You know, you guys are harder mm-hmm. to hit, and, uh, mm-hmm. and could like do uh, uh, infiltration deployment and, and stuff like that. And ferocity was like they don't run away, which I, yeah. I, I mean, I guess it could be uh, somewhat characterful. But to tell you the truth, Camel, in any of the Necromunda campaigns I played, and I then nobody ever had a scavy gang. The only time I play is in like pickup games at my house with my brother when we were kids. Hmm. The models weren't super common. And, like, there were only three Plague Zombie models, if I recall correctly, which, when you want to have, I don't know, a dozen of them or whatever, is going to start looking really repetitive. Right. So, Scavies, I, I actually like the gang a whole lot. I think it, with their cheap dudes and cheap weapons and whatever, I think they could have been a, a pretty nasty game, and you know, mm-hmm. the numbers game, pretty much. Yeah. But uh, it's super easy to break the game with them, uh, with Plague Zombies, if unless your uh, guy who's running your campaign says something about it. Yeah. That being said, their model range, as small as it was, was pretty good. Like for for the time, especially their models were pretty all right. So they have a special character that is actually two special characters that are related to Scavies. Oh, yeah. uh, one of them is King Redwart the Magnificent, who mm-hmm. never got a model, as far as I know, oh. and kind of sucks. <laughs> like just it's just like why he's got like an auto pistol and a s- stick, and a stick with a speaker on it. Yeah, he's just not like good. Really, he, I guess he's there to buff leadership, is what he does. But there's then there's a plague zombie specific character, and it's good old Karloff Valoy or Valois or Valois or whatever. But Val- I always said like Illinois, Chaboy Valoy, your Chaboy Valoy, Karloff Valoy. This yep. guy was actually a fucking monster. He had a very good stat line. He had uh, he was a weird, and his weird par- power was zombie master. And so his thing is. Uh, Karloth can influence plague zombies with his powers, both by summoning them and motivating them. If Karloth is present, uh, add plus one to each dice roll for the number of zombies summoned. Jesus. So he's paying for his, his uh, uh, actual pretty large points pretty effectively there by adding more zombies. And then he's got this thing where he, like, he doesn't get hurt. He doesn't break. Uh, he's weird power, so he's got all sorts of like the extra weird powers and everything, and he makes the zombies around him better. Uh, so he's he's... Like a summoner, a very good summoner character. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so we were talking about problematic things. The scavies in this case are problematic because they're poor. And yeah, and 
because they're poor, they're kind of villainized. They're villainized and they're shown as disgusting and not worthy of pity or not worthy of help uh, and unable to do anything different except be poor and disgusting. And uh, that is a little shitty, Campbell. That, yeah, that is a little shitty, especially because like Nottingham's a working class town. <laughs> Yeah, it's not a it's not a nice not a super nice place, I don't think. No, nah, it's like it's jokingly called Shottingham by some, but this cuz like a, a guy gets shot once in a great while. It's it's not as bad as like anywhere here. But <laughs> literally anywhere in the United States. <laughs> literally anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, so that that kind of that's I think that's as as we go on we're going to discover that that's the least problematic of all the uh uh, yeah, of all the things. there's there's some plausible deniability there where it's like, oh, no, I just thought swamp mutants. And you'd, I didn't think about the rest of the implications. But the further you get into this, the less those the less that argument will hold water. Yeah. So what is the next most problematic gang? So the next most pro- problematic game, we're, we're kind of at its high here with, yeah. with the next two because they're both really bad. Uh, but I'm going to go with uh, f- <laughs> the next most problematic outliner gang are the redemptionists. Okay, so I will say I think in some ways they're less problematic than the next guys after them, um, but we'll go on about them. <laughs> so you know how you know how the Imperium, like the Imperial religion, is the, is Catholicism, like medieval Catholicism especially, taken to its illogical conclusion, turned like up to tur- eleven. Yeah, this is turned up to thirteen, and then the Renab is ripped off. <laughs> like this is this psychotic doomsday cult. Um, militant are militant, non-recognized branch of the imperial religion. Right. These guys are a cross between like the super psycho witch hunter, like Spanish Inquisition guys, mm-hmm. and the KKK. Granted, the uh, so the reason they compared to the KKK in addition to the whole psycho preacher type guys who burn things is because they have these big hoods which they wear to hide their identities from unbelievers and outsiders of, the, of their uh, organization. That being said, those hoods were co-opted by the KKK. They were actually used by the church well before that. There's like art from the 1300s of the of, you know, Christian churches and priests and stuff wearing those sorts of things, but they are still spooky. I can't tell if you're being a KKK apologist or a I, Inquisition I'm saying, apologist. <laughs> Let's go. With no, that was okay. Apo- that was needlessly that, that, inflammatory. That's a, that's I'm a sorry. bait. That's a that's a bait. That's I'm, a bait. There's no good answer it, there. No, I'm I'm sorry. That's, that's a Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> <laughs> the only way to win is to cheat. All right, so. Let's talk about the Redemptionists. Uh, they're religious fanatics with a flair for the murderous. Uh, and so, the, again, they're outlanders. These guys are have left polite society, and they basically say, we're going to go have our own homesteads in the waste or in the sump or whatever, and they're going to be religious, uh, like, uh, what do you call it, uh, outp- outposts or uh, towns or whatever, where the Missions. whole thing is like Redemptionist is a cult. So, yes. and it's not just a cult of violent psychopaths. It's also a cult of uh, nonviolent psychopaths, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> <laughs> who who are like homesteaders or whatever. Uh, as I think, uh, you know, we talked the last time we talked about Necromunda. Necromunda is a little bit like the Wild West in the way they mm-hmm. present everything. And so these guys are like the crazy super religious sects that go out into the mountains and make their own city. Yeah, they see sin in every creature, and all sin must be destroyed. Ergo, everything must be destroyed. Yeah. And the only way to save humanity is to cleanse it from sin. And, like, everything is sinful. Everyone's a sinner, but mutants and psychers and heretics are, like, extra sinners. Yeah, they're the number one problems. And so what these guys do is every now and then you get a crusade going. And each gang is part of a redemptionist crusade. And that Mm -hmm. crusade goes around and just murders stuff because they feel like it, basically. But then they couch it and like, oh, but we're getting rid of sin and whatever. Uh, So these guys, interestingly, I thought, had a easier easier time of getting territory, keeping territory, using territory, getting income and trading and getting money and recruits. Normally, Scavies and uh, Ratskins, they have a hard time with equipment. But these guys, because... There are uh, uh, people and like uh, like dummy corporations basically funneling them money and weapons. They don't have a hard time getting weapons like other other uh, uh, other outlander gangs do. 
Well, their religion, their cult is also the official religion of House Cawdor, which is one of the main house gangs. So they obviously have those connections in the Underhive, as a, in addition to whatever they scavenge out in the Outlands. Right. And so unlike other Outlanders and outlaw gangs, they cannot use weirds. They cannot use hired guns at all, actually. Because they are unclean. They are sinners. Redemptionists would never pay sinners to do the work of salvation, is what it says <laughs> right there. They cannot use hired guns. Uh, they There's a rule for... Uh, uh, star- it's not a rule, it's just starvation. Redemptionists suffer the effects of starvation just like anybody else. In fact, they rather like the feeling of self-denial <laughs> and the ecstatic visions and extreme privation, or that extreme privation can cause. Well, they also do not approve of drugs or alcohol, so they're like the obnoxious straight-edge guys who are real dicks about it. Right. So these guys, because they have better ac- main- access to mainstream weapons and stuff, they do have a lot better weapons than the other Outlander gangs, and they have a few weapons that I think were pretty fucking great, uh, namely the Exterminator and the Eviscerator. Now, if Let's you're a they're... fan of 40k and you have an Imperial Guard armor, you probably know what an Eviscerator is. This is a giant two-handed chainsword that fucks everything up. This is actually where it came from. Yeah. Theirs are a little different, though. They often have flamethrowers attached to them. Exactly. They have the Exterminator, which is a one-shot flamer. And that doesn't only attach to the Eviscerator, but it can attach to shotguns or auto guns or Now, these guys didn't have any laser or uh, beam or plasma weapons or anything. They only had, like, uh, hard rounds and flamers and melted guns mm-hmm. and stuff. Because, you know, they're going with the theme of flames and burning <laughs> the really, sin out of humanity. They're really devoted to that theme. Yeah. Uh, so... You could pop a flamer on a shotgun, and now your your boy's got, oh, look, there's a couple of guys grouped up. Well, I'll just use this one-shot flamer for this round. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything more Warhammer than a chainsaw that is also a flamethrower. <laughs> I'm having a very hard time. A chainsaw hat is the answer to that. Like that's, your Goliath that's boy That's true, because he is a bald guy screaming with a chainsaw hat. So uh, these guys, and I remember mentioning this, these guys were the first 40K models, or first Games Workshop models I ever bought. Yeah, they are. I saw their pictures on the uh, on the box with their red robes covered in flames and stuff, and I was like, "Oh, these guys look awesome!" and and then bought them and painted them terribly. I think I still have the Redemptor Priest, the leader, around I somewhere. Had, he had a melt gun and a book. <laughs> what he was armed with? Uh, Knowledge is power. So the fucking flamers everywhere, like they're big on burning stuff. They focus almost exclusively on the ferocity skill which means that mm-hmm. they uh, are very hard to break and they don't run out of combat easily. Um, and they're pretty fucking problematic. We, I mean, it, I can also kind of say, you know, they're, I, I can rule them as at least parody. A little bit, yeah, a little satire. Yeah, yeah. It, it's satire and it's draw, it is drawing from history. Like, it, it is drawing from their own history, too. Like, it is drawing from the history of, you know, England and Europe and all that, too. Right. As opposed to the history of another culture that they might not know anything about. Right. So these, uh, again, these are, I'd say, a little more problematic than the Scavies, but but not nearly as problematic as our next two gangs. And let's move on to them. The next, Campbell, Mm -hmm. are the Spirers, or the Spire Hunters. (laughs) The one percenter's wet dream. Oh, man. (laughs) This one... this oh. one's bad. This this one's pretty bad, guys. These are rich nobles who go into the hives and hunt the poor and downtrodden for sport and reputation. Yep. Doesn't get a whole lot worse than like, that. These are actual spoiled rich kids. Like, that is, that is canon. They are spoiled rich kids who've never known hardship, who, to prove they're worthy of becoming planetary governors or planetary politicians, go and murder poor people. It is the Purge, but in Necromunda. I love the Purge movies. Have you ever seen any of them? I still haven't. I kind of want to, though. They look ridiculous. So the first one is your standard, like, stalker, thriller mm-hmm. movie, whatever. It's it's pretty good. Uh, but then the second one and the third one sort of were like, you know what? We're going to do social commentary <laughs> instead of horror movies now. And they're, they're I don't know if I'd call it. They're, they're ham-handed. Social, okay, ham fisted rather, heavy, there heavy handed or ham fisted, whatever. Uh, social commentary on the rich preying upon the poor, which is exactly what the spirers do. Uh, I have it written in my notes here: young Republicans wet dream. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, so yeah. these guys are from the super rich houses, and they get up in these fancy suits of armor with these fancy weapons or whatever. They get kicked out. They get sent down to the hive, and they have to fulfill a vow. Uh, and you can take your your spire gang or whatever can take one of three vows, uh, which are basically just to limit them. Mm-hmm. So like uh, so one of them is like you have to kill a total of one gang fighter for each starting member or earn a total of 200 experience points for each starting member or whatever. Start, uh, and one of these vows, and once it's completed, then your gang disbands. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's done. You have to, if you're playing in a longer campaign, that Spire gang is done and you have to start a new one or something. Uh, but I think there are rules later, like introducing White Dwarf, be like, hire back your Spires if they want to come mm-hmm. back and kill some more poor people. Uh, yeah, but these guys are stupidly powerful. Extremely powerful. Powerful, so they have cutting edge. Like they're they're, they're basically like space marines. They're fighting kind of better than space marines in some ways because <laughs> the hunt. All right, so they've got these hunting rigs, which are these super powerful suits that self repair, self sustain, and evolve with the wearers. And there's no technology like that anywhere else in 40k that I can really think of. No, and that's that's just higher tech than it has any right to be. So the whole thing about this gang is it's super small, where you yes. would usually get between like four and six members of the gang. Though, if you're playing super cool mode, you'd only have one of each type of suit. And there are four types of suit. Mm. Uh, the Jakara, Malkadon, Oris, and Yeld suits. And they all do different things. The Jakara yeah. has a mirror shield and a monomolecular sword. That's a hard word to say. Uh, <laughs> and the mirror shield can take uh, like shots of stuff that are coming uh, at her. The Jakara is a female character. Uh, mm-hmm. And then she can project it back at the shooters. Which uh, yep. and that can that starts out with like it can take like laser weapons and project them back, but it can evolve into kinetic energy, blast, and even flame weapons can get absorbed by the shield and then fired back, which yeah. is kind of a fucking awesome power. Yeah, that's kind of everything. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the Yeld had wings and could fly, and it had a sniper rifle esque kind of laser gauntlet deal. Yeah. But they also had like chameleonic armor, and I don't get why you'd want the guys who can fly to also be the guys who hide. That felt kind of like not chocolate and peanut butter there, you know? Yeah, no, you're you're right about that. They were a little misguided, perhaps. Yeah. They, oh, and heads heads up, all of these models, save for the matriarchs and patriarchs, are terrible. No, I disagree. Really? I you think, think st- I think half of the models are terrible. <laughs> okay. Because so no, there were there were the yelds. I think the yelds are both fine. Both the elves are fine. Okay. One of them's pointing his gun. The other one's like holding it up, like like he just fired or something. Uh, yeah. The there is a good Jakara and a bad Jakara. There is mm-hmm. a good Malkadon, uh, who's got half his face open, and then there's the bad Malkadon, which is like waving. He's like, "Hey guys, yeah. I'm a Spider Man." Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then there's the good Oris, uh, which is not pointing his fist at somebody who's got his oh. fist out. And then there's the bad Oris, who is pointing, and he's got cool Macho Man Randy Savage glasses on. <laughs> I think they're both hideous. But let's go with the Oris guys next. Yeah. Um, imagine Ludacris in the Get Back music video. <laughs> that's accurate. And, yeah, and that's that. They just these dudes with these like really silly muscle suits and giant fists. Giant um, fists with uh, racks of bolt launchers, like bolters. On the fists yeah. themselves. They, they were uh, aggressors. Primaris aggressors. Yeah. No, aggressors just ripping off Gary Morley's sculpts from 22 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> uh, so these guys were close combat monsters. They weren't that fast, though, but they mm-hmm. had uh, good armor. and oh, ar- I mean, they had armor. All of them had armor, which is yeah. like super rare in Necromunda. Well, at least it yeah. was. Nowadays, everybody's got it. But uh, And then there was my favorite, the Malkadon, who was a cross yeah. between Spider-Man and Wolverine. <laughs> Which is the best the best superhero of all time. Not not oh. not Spider-Man or Wolverine. Spider-Man and w- Spiderine, if you will. <laughs> Wolverman. <laughs> yeah, so these guys had claws. They had little web shooters that didn't do any damage, but they would <laughs> hold uh models in and they could they could move over any terrain with their with because they were moving with their web shooters. Mm-hmm. Uh, Much is, like the Reavers now. Man, they're just mining these guys for ideas. I mean, they're stealing, they're cribbing their own ideas. 
Which, yeah, no, you never never throw anything right. out. So these guys, uh, once you start your gang, you cannot recruit new members. Hmm. With the you can, I think the matriarch and patriarch like came in later, and those were sort of more hired guns ish type uh, figures for spire gangs. Uh, I actually yeah. don't know much about them because I wasn't playing uh, Necromunda at that point. But so, so matriarchs and patriarchs are the people who send them out to do jobs. Essentially, and they and sometimes the the people from way up in the hive would come down themselves and you'd have the matriarchs who were they were faster and they had camo cloaks and this crazy chain scythe weapon. And then the patriarchs who have mecha dendrites with claws and lasers and shit. And if you have either of those models, they are super rare. Yeah, but they're not good either. I think those are the good models nah, they have in the range. One of them's with all the spindly shit. I mean, I'm not saying no. I'd look forward to touching up all those chipped paint, you know, chipped paint spots, but I think the models are good for those two. Fucking break in a heartbeat. Are you kidding me? Anyways, they can't recruit new <laughs> new members and they can't get new equipment, but their equipment evolves as you uh, as you play. So when you get experience, you you know you roll on your advance table or whatever, and there's these things called power boosts, which. Uh, make your either like give you a better armor save or give you more movement or give your make your gun better or make your sword better or something so their equipment would literally evolve as the campaign went now sometimes it wouldn't evolve in the right direction as you know with necromunda you'd be like all yeah. right cool i got a weapon skill increase and now my gun is better and it's kind of like god god gosh darn it but it what you is. could do what you could do uh, and this is this is uh, Spires on hard mode. Is you only you take one of each to start, right? Mm-hmm. And then you spend the rest of your gold or your gold rather credits on training. <laughs> and so you can uh, ten ten credits gets you D six experience points before the campaign starts. And so you sink all of that, and I think it's like either seven or eight D six per guy uh, of uh, experience points, which usually gives you like two or three levels before the game even starts before the campaign mm-hmm. even starts uh and then your spires are kind of nasty well they start nasty and that's how you make them kind of godlike yeah uh but the, this gang clearly super problematic because mm-hmm. it's rich people hunting poor people for sport yeah no it is now on the yeah, table there's not really much more to it on the table every now and then you'd come up against a spire gang they weren't that good they just okay. they just weren't that good because there's not enough of them. Yeah, Necromunda skews heavily towards large numbers, like you know, because well, uh, safety numbers game. Yeah, so much of it is for security and battle tests, and also just to knock guys down. Because even if you don't have a very good weapon, you can still knock somebody down. And if you only have two or three models shooting or whatever per turn, that's going to give you a lot more opportunity, right. or a lot less opportunity to actually do that. Oh, you've got four or five models in your gang. Cool, I've got twelve. So <laughs> yep. good luck getting close because again most of the uh, most of the spire stuff was up close work too. Mm-hmm. So let's uh, let's move on, Campbell, to a uh, necromonic gang that honestly makes me uncomfortable to talk about. Yeah, yeah, y- you're you ready to talk about a caricature of Native Americans created by people who don't know any Native Americans? Uh, yes, I am. This last gang is called the Ratskin Renegades, and you might already be saying, "What the fuck." <laughs> Excuse I me. Mean, the name right from the start could be a little more on the nose, but it's not great. No, it's, so, it's already pretty bad. Ratsk- Ratskins, um, they they don't avoid the hive because they were shunned. No, they avoid civilization because because uh, well, they're basically a naturalistic, shamanistic sort of non-imperial based group that lives outside. By choice, they see the hive not as a city, but as a living, breathing thing that and they can predict when it's going to have hive quakes and sump floods and stuff like that because they are so in tune with the spirits of the hive. Yeah, they're the noble savages of Necromunda. It is made. They use the word nobility and savagery pretty often in their description. It's extremely gross. Yeah. Yeah. So these these guys are Native American tribes in the underhead. They're attuned to nature. They have yes. shamanistic powers. They go on vision quests. Their totem warriors go on vision quests, please. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Because <laughs> everybody else goes on vision quests, too. Uh, they have, like, antiquated weapons. They're decorated in bones and skins. 
Yep, uh, they favor close combat, especially their braves. When they get exposed to civilization of the underhive, they get addicted to alcohol, drugs, and gambling. <laughs> that being said, I, I admired their restraint to not mention them opening any gambling halls. That was like, who? good on you. <laughs> good on you for not sinking to the lowest depths you can sink to. Yeah, so this 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 stuff is, like, honestly, it's gross. Yeah. It's 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 oily, it's gross, it's bad. Uh it's it paints a picture of what like you said, people who don't know anything about Native Americans and the honest struggle that Native Americans go through in modern society and it's just it's a caricature. It gets like extra grosser when you realize that most Native Americans were killed by uh Englishmen off the boat. Yeah. So <laughs> and their descendants. So this one no, it's <laughs> It's squicky. Yeah, I've got uh, my last note here is just like um, it's British people should stay away from this stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. And I agree. Y- y- do you remember when um, what's her name? Harry Potter lady. What's her name? J.K. Rowling. She made a bunch of like she made like an American style wizard school, right? For her like new film or whatever. Okay. And when she was talking about like the types of magic and stuff that they use. She was talking about like the Native Americans and how they oh, were no. like, no, no, this is terrible. Also, she's like, uh, they were like big into like shape shifting and knew a lot about nature magic and stuff. But it wasn't until the Europeans showed up with wands that their magic oh. could get refined. No, I am not making this up. No, and Whew. like I, I'm sure we have some some British li- listeners. Uh, that listen to our podcast and guys just stay the fuck away from it. You know, like stick to European history. You've got a lot to work with. It's uh, it's cultural appropriation and it's very gross and very, very bad. Yeah. Now granted, this was also like a while ago. This fluff was written and all of the outlander stuff has not really been touched on very much by the new Necromunda yet. Uh, all instances, like it used to be you'd get a rat skin scout to be someone who could help you find a map or help you track targets. Because, of course, they're natural navigators and trackers. But um, now there's just like, oh, you hire a dome runner. You hire a scout. You know, they just kind of kept the name off. So I don't know if they'll bring rat skins back or in what shape or form they do. I can only assume they'll be less awful about it. But I, eh. I, I hope they don't, man. I really I, Really hope they don't. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably for the best if they don't. All right. Well, that was kind of a downer end to it. So we're going to spice it back up with a little bit of fan fiction challenge. Whoa. Yeah. So we asked you guys, you guys, the listeners, the most important part of the show to send us in fan fiction related to Principal Emperor and his schoolyard adventures. So... 40K High School is what the Fan Fiction Challenge was called, and a lot of great submissions came in. And Campbell, why don't you read your favorite first? So I'm going to read one of my favorites. This one seems aimed pretty much straight at me. It is by Enon Tall on the Something Awful Forums. Mr. Dorn, are you aware that your son is still eating paste? Principal Emperor's question echoed solemnly across the small classroom that had been set aside for the parent-teacher conferences. Emperor, damn it, Biff Tundrish, you're 17, Emperor, damn, years old, Rogel yelled at his son. What are you going to, Emperor, damn, learn? Principal Emperor shot Mr. Doran a disappointed look. Sorry, Rogel added, slumping into his chair and dropping his head down into his golden sweater vest. <laughs> Thankfully, Biff Tundrish didn't seem to notice the exchange. He was too distracted by the gold stars adorning the wall beside him. Great job, you've got it. Nice one, they read. Words that Biff had never before heard in his short, gene-enhanced life. <laughs> and to be honest, Principal Emperor continued, all his yelling about <clears throat> alien buttholes is deeply disturbing the other children. Rogel Doran hefted, sighed a hefty imperial sigh. All he ever wanted was a normal child, he lamented. A child that could take the Thunderhawk to school like the other kids, no. not this Storm Raven riding nitwit. No. <laughs> Speaking of problematic. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Dorn. I really am, Principal Emperor added, but we have to deal with the realities of our current situation. We may have to find an alternative arrangement for Biff. What do you mean? Homeschooling? 
No way. There's got to be something else. Something we haven't thought of. My construction job just doesn't leave me enough time to watch over him. <laughs> Principal, Emperor, <laughs> Principal Emperor thought to himself for a moment. Well, he said, I heard that Dark Angel Company master applications are open and open again. <laughs> Hell, they even took some 30-year-old a few weeks ago. <laughs> Perfect! Biff yelled, jumping up from his plastic chair. He smiled, fist pumping the air. A single stream of drool fell to the floor. And that was the Parent Tundrish Conference. <laughs> Anything with Biff Tundrish is going to be good in my book. I love that it had a callback to the fan fiction about the guy who could run a mile and a half in 20 minutes <laughs> and join the Dark Angels. Yeah, I like a good and, callback. Yeah, and just I I really like little touches that just make characters like Rokotorn mundane as shit, like having a construction job and wearing a sweater vest that are still in character, but uh, are a bit, a, a bit different from how you're used to seeing him in the actual game. Right. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a really good one. <laughs> All right, so I've got one by Mr. Spunk McClunk, and it's called... Christian name. Good Christian name. Yeah. Called 40K High School, The Field Trip. Principal Emperor looked up from his drink to the clock behind the beachside bar where he had spent the last two hours waiting. He would need to be leaving soon. He needed to be waiting at the docks when the field trip returned from their sea tour. Well, he mused to himself, scheduled to return anyways. He was still quite proud of his scheme. At the end of last summer, he adopted 20 children, enough for a full class's worth. Since he was the principal of a private boarding school, he made sure there were problems having them all receive full scholarships with room and board included. Hmm. 20 kids worth of tax benefits, free lunches, <laughs> and other benefits, all without having to drop a cent on them himself. As the end of the school year approached, he decided the field trip would be in order. Today was that field trip. And it truly was the icing on the cake. Principal Emperor thought back to when he parked the bus just after lunch that afternoon. All 20 of the little shits rushed out towards the <laughs> Shandy, Shandy Beach. Everyone line up. We have a schedule to keep, yelled Principal Emperor. He started checking off names of each of his sons in turn. He quickly learned that head counts were nigh useless with this group. Alpharius was all especially energetic and responsible for many inaccuracies. No matter how careful Principal Emperor was, he always seemed to count him twice. With that out of the way, Principal Emperor approached Captain Grumby, whose ship they had chartered. Captain Grumby apologized again that the short cruise had been double booked and that he would ensure that his first mate would take more care in the future. Principal Emperor assured him that this was fine, that he would gladly give up his seat for one of the other passengers who suggested that the first mate be tasked with watching the class. After all, he was a mighty sailing man. Once that was out of the way, Principal Emperor retired to the bar where he began ordering Shiner Golden Ales. <laughs> As he got up to leave, he noticed a report on the television. Although the day had started off sunny, the meteorologists on screen began reporting that the weather started getting rough and that small ships should avoid the open seas, lest they be tossed. As Principal Emperor had anticipated, no ship docked that afternoon or evening. He reported the missing ship and children. Soon he would be collecting 20 life insurance policies. He just needed to wait for the investigation to be concluded and determination issues. He also relished in the publicity he received as the kindly man who provided home for so many poor orphans before tragedy struck. After a few months, it was finally official. The SS Minnow had been lost with all 27 souls aboard. It's just missing a part later where Malkador hits Gera with his hat. <laughs> I really like this one. It it made me at the last couple of lines there it made me laugh out loud. I thought mm -hmm. it was a, I could could see it coming from mm -hmm. as soon as he started talking about tiny ships being tossed. I was like, oh, he's gonna make a Gilligan's Island joke, <laughs> and it delivered. That's one of the longer lead ups to a Gilligan's Island joke I can think of. So we received a ton of really good fan fiction challenge entries this time and, around and some really not so good ones I, and i want to I, I just want to want to tell one listener one thing jd listen man your story was good but it was also four pages long <laughs> it's too long we don't want to read it do better next time 
Brevity is the soul of wit, JD. Also, it was wonderful. I, I, if I felt like spending half an hour to read on there, I totally would. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, everybody, for sending in your entries. I'm sure we'll read some more as we uh, as we go down the go down the road here. Uh, there, a lot of them are really really funny. Yeah, I really enjoyed how many people sent in ones that maybe wouldn't read so well. Like there were a few which were basically the notes from uh, a parent teacher conference type meeting and stuff like that, which it's fun to read the experiments with the format, even if they might not work as well for the typical uh, dramatic reading sort of style. So, Campbell, let's get out of here, man. Yeah, we can probably get on going. Let's uh, let's drop some hot plugs on y'all. Yeah, so uh, contact us at contact at 40kbadcast.com. Email us stuff. People have been emailing us models, terrain, fan fiction, <laughs> nude pictures. Not, not true. Don't don't send us nude Please pictures. Please don't. Especially if Please yourself. don't. Just don't do that. Uh, send us whatever you want, you know. We we want to we want to connect with you. We want to talk with you. We want to get to know our listeners a little bit. I know our our friend LT just sent an email in the other day uh, asking, you know, when when I would want to get a game again since we're we're local to the DC yeah. area. If you are local to the DC area and think, "Hey, it might be fun to play against a voice that you hear every couple of weeks." I would agree. Reach <laughs> out, contact at 40kbadcast.com. We'll get together. They'll be very disappointed when they find you are not just a disembodied voice that makes zingers. <laughs> no, I'm a real terrible human. Uh, <laughs> Campbell, we're on Twitter. I am at yes, we are. DB underscore Sleazy. He is at Brother SRM. I retweeted a bunch of nice model photos today. I tweet about grape crimes and my power metal experiences. Uh, I also put on Twitter recent photos of my models that I've finished, my Raven Guard Primaris Marines. So if you want to see those, head on over to Twitter.com. And if you want to see my models, Goku... Goku, fuck. <laughs> oh, over 9,000 mistakes in every recording. Wow. A little bit of a Freudian slip there. All right, if you want to go con over to cam2d.tumblr.com, you can see pictures of my models. There is no there is no Ku Goku there, I can tell you that. Um, but yeah, heading over there, I'll be posting pictures of the Templar stuff I just finished recently that I was talking about earlier in the show. I'll be posting that. I will not be posting the Vespid because I'm not that happy with how they came out, but you know, whatever. You can also support the show. Go to shop.spreadshirt.com slash camtoons. Yeah, I know it's not bad cast, it's camtoons, it's fine. And you can go buy your own very bad cast bad shirt for you. It comes in various cuts, colors, and sizes, and it's super comfy, as Dan can attest to, as he owns two. Buy them. They every buy every em. every shirt you buy gets us a little bit closer to one of us owning an Astraeus. <laughs> so this is the last show before Adepticon, and if you wanna, if you're going to Adepticon, if you're planning on attending, and you see a big dumb guy with a beard in a bad cast bad shirt uh, playing with Primaris Raven Guard, come say hi. It's probably me. But about to say until you got to the uh, to the, it's like oh. Let's look for a big guy with a beard. Hmm. Yeah, that's hmm. gonna be that's gonna be uh, not a whole lot of those in this hobby. Hmm. Yeah, I'd love to meet people, uh, listeners of the show. Maybe even people wearing bad cast bad shirts. Yeah, you can have the largest congregation of bad cast bad shirts in the world outside of your dresser. <laughs> you know, I know at least one person, Craig Sniff, and our friend uh, has has a bad cast bad shirt, uh, and he'll be at Adepticon. So there will at least be two of us. That's wonderful. I, here's the thing is if people don't know it's a po- I mean, I guess people will figure out it's a podcast pretty quickly. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of strange folks wearing the same shirt hanging out together. <laughs> it's like, look at those popular idiots. <laughs> look, at, look at these fuck this fucking cult. This fucking cult of douchebags. <laughs> All right, man. Do you have an inspiring quote that will lift us and sustain us for the next two I weeks will, before? Uh, this quote. Well, actually, let me think about it. Um. It might be three weeks till the next episode. About to say, because you're going to be out of town for Adepticon, which, again, I'm bummed I can't make it, but I'll be hearing all about it, and I'll be seeing everybody at Nova. And until then, here's an inspirational quote to lift and separate you. (laughs) No servant of the Emperor dies unavenged. No enemy of the Emperor escapes unpunished. Ain't that the truth. My name is Dan Boyd. He's Campbell McLaughlin. We're bad at 40K, and so can you. We'll see you next time. Scene, the Emperor's Throne Room. 
Superintendent Reboot Gilliman has just been revived and has traveled to Holy Terra to meet his father and discuss the state of the Empire. Well, Emperor, I made it. Despite your directions. Ah, Primarch Gilman, welcome. I hope you're prepared for an unforgettable meeting. <sighs> the Emperor sees Cadia fall because he sees everything or whatever. Oh, we gods! My empire is ruined! But what if I were to steal some new troops and disguise them as my own creation? Ho <laughs> ho ho, delightfully Zinchian Emperor. Seymour! Primarch, I was just, uh, just stretching my mind to prevent heresy. Isometric exercise. Care to join me? Why is there chaos coming out of the Cadian Gate, Emperor? Oh, uh, oh, that isn't chaos. It's the Inari. Inari from the Inari Eldar we're having. Hmm, Inari Eldar. Woo. Scene. Back in the throne room. Primarch, I hope you're ready for mouth-watering Primaris Marines. I thought we were having Inari Eldar. No, oh, no. I said Inari Eldar. That's what I call Primaris Marines. You call Primaris Marines Inari Eldar? Yes. It's a regional dialect. Uh huh. Uh, what region? Uh, upstate Ultima Segmentum. Well, I'm from McCrag, and I've never heard anybody use the phrase Inari Eldar. Oh, not McCrag. No, it's a Kelf expression. I see. You know, these Primaris Marines are quite similar to the ones Belisarius Call makes. Oh, no. Patented Emperor Marines. Old family recipe. For Inari Eldar. Yes. Yes. And you call them Inari Eldar despite the fact that they are obviously Marines. Yeah, you know, the one thing I should... Excuse me for a second. Of course. The Emperor of Mankind leaves, then comes back. Reboot Gilliman clearly sees the Cicatrix Maledictum ripping the galaxy apart. Oh, well that was wonderful. A good time was had by all. I'm pooped. Yes, I should be... Good lord! What is happening in there? The Eye of Terror? Uh, <clears throat> the Eye of Terror. At this time of year, at this time of day, in this part of the galaxy, localized throughout your empire. Yes. May I see it? No. Emperor! The galaxy is on fire! No, Creed, it's just the Eye of Terror. Well, Seymour, you are an odd fellow, but I must say you and Arya good Eldar. Help! Help!